Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can be here today in your presence. I thank you that we can um, come to learn, to worship, to enter into communion with you. And God, I thank you that that is not just on a Sunday, that we can do that all the time, that the veil was torn, that you desire a relationship with us, and that you pursue us in that way that allows us to do that, God. I pray that um, you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, God. I pray that you would give us hearts to receive what is what you have for us in your word today, God. I do pray, Lord, that as I speak, that it would be your words only, God, that it would not be um, from my mouth, but from your mouth, God. Holy Spirit, would you arrest our attention? Would you cause us to hear what you have us to hear? Would you correct anything that comes out not quite right? And would you just speak to the hearts and the minds of everybody listening today, God? We thank you so much. In your name, we give you all the praise and the glory. Amen and amen. Well, kiddos, you can head back today. We've got Miss Neva and Miss Kirsten and Emma. You've got a whole bunch of people back there excited to work with you today. Oh, man. You know what? I am learning a lot about what Pastor Jerry does. I'm learning a lot about myself, too. Like, my posture is not great. My back, after standing up on the stage, clearly I'm sitting too much at work these days. And you get a little more active. My back. Pastor Jerry, like, goes up and down the stairs and, like, gets excited and dances. He is probably 20 years older than me and has more energy. Praise the Lord for that. Thank God for Pastor Jerry. I can only imagine, I hope that that means that if I keep going on this track, that I will also become more energetic as I get older. I'm going to believe that that's the case. It would be awesome, right? That's right. With long life, he will satisfy me. So as I get older and older, I'm going to be running up and down all around. So um, in the last three weeks, we've been doing, this is our last week, we've been doing a series on how the Father sees us. I said that God gave me this content about a year ago, and of course, it looks nothing like what I thought it was going to look like because that's how the Holy Spirit works in my life. I don't know how it works in your life. Probably similar. I usually get this idea, and I'm like, okay, this is what God's calling me to do, and God's like, wrong, um, and gives me a clearer picture of what he was actually calling me to do. So we've been talking about, uh, we, we looked at Matthew 7, and toward the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and we talked about how Jesus said, therefore, oh, actually, that's lower. What, what we actually talked about, that's a good one too, though. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of, of heaven. And he goes on to say, many will say to me, but Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name, do miracles, heal people in your name? And I will say to them, I did not know you. And so we recognized that what the Lord is looking for from us is not how hard we can work for him, but who we are to him. He desires relationship with us, not just religion. Now, to be fair, religion, practicing religion, there are pieces of that that are very important. We come together on Sundays as a piece of what that looks like, right? We come together on Sundays. We build each other up. We engage in relationship together. We celebrate holidays. We take communion, and these things all taken together can look like religion, but without relationship, they're empty, Okay. God desires to know us. That word know in the Bible we looked at is this, um, the definition is like this deep, deep intimacy, like between a husband and a wife. And so he desires to know us deeply and for us to know him. We said this, that he wants us for who we are to him, not for what we can do for him. Amen. And that's good news because guess what? God doesn't need you for what you can do for him. God can accomplish anything that he wants without your help. I said in first service, and I'm going to say it again because it's important, I need to be reminded of this weekly. So if you see me, it's okay for you to ask me, have you been reminded lately that God doesn't need you? It's not offensive because God wants me. He doesn't need me. He wants me because we step into this place of thinking God needs us to do something for him. Like if I just work hard enough, this is that spirit of religion that wants to trick us out of deep relationship and into just working hard, right? 
So he doesn't need us. He wants us. And he demonstrated our worth to him, that he wanted us, our worth to him through creation. This was that first week we talked about that God intimately, not just purposefully and intentionally, but intimately created mankind with his hands breathing life into mankind. And so our worth to God made in his image is demonstrated through that. And then again, through redemption, when Jesus came to bring us back into fullness of relationship with God. Not that we were children that were no longer children, that we had sinned and became no longer children, but that we were children of God that no longer could enter into full of the fullness of relationship with him. And so Jesus came to fix that for us. We said our worth is in our very breath, that God breathed his life in us, and he sees us as worthy. He sees us with unimaginable worth because of that. And then last week we talked about identity, and I started by saying that we are a people, firstly, we are a people that likes to categorize. This is why the spirit of religion is so dangerous, because one, it tricks us into thinking we're doing the right things, but two, because we are a people that likes to make categories. We're a people that likes to say it's either this or that. We're a people that likes to say this is how you cross off the boxes because then we know that we're doing it right. And we are a people that will want to find our worth from our identity, right? So I'm the person that does this, therefore I'm worthy. I'm the school counselor that created that program, so therefore I have worth. And what I said that sounds wrong but is right, and that's kind of how the kingdom of God works in our culture, is that... I learned that we are supposed to find our worth from our identity. That is not the wrong part. The wrong part is where we find our identity. We are supposed to find our worth from our identity because our identity is child of God. It's made in the image of God. It is created intentionally, wonderfully, beautifully. And if we find our identity there, then our worth is where it's supposed to be. It's what it's supposed to be. We said that if you find your identity in anything else, if you find your identity in being the star OSU baseball player, or which we could have used yesterday, or if you find your identity in being a school counselor or a mom or a pastor, these things are attached to the world. They're temporal, and they will and can be shaken. And when that happens, when your identity is in the one thing and being the woman that looks like this and the, the, or the man that looks like this or whatever that is and it's shaken and your worth is attached to that, then you become worthless, right? So we said that your identity should be found in the Father and that time in his presence causes us to reflect him as confident men and women of God, exactly the way he expects and has made us to be and not easily shaken. We're going to finish today talking about our purpose. I knew um, early on that we were probably going to do these three, worth, identity, and purpose. I wasn't exactly sure how it would look, but praise God, um, I've had some, I've shared with you guys, I've had experiences through all of these things that God has used to teach me lessons that then I um, have felt called to share with you guys and, and hopefully bless your heart in that way. And this week, again, I had an experience where I thought one thing about purpose, and God said, this, this, is, this is the thing I want you to see about purpose. Each time we've talked about worth or identity, we talk about purpose, I have found that we have been examining the contrast, haven't we? We've been talking about how the Father sees us, how does the Father see our worth, and how do we see our worth? How does the Father see our identity, and how do we see our identity? And I believe we've seen a lot of ways that it doesn't line up, that we see things through this idea of working hard, or we see things through the spirit of religion, or we see things in the way that the world sees things, and it's not how God wants us to see things. And as we examine who the Father is and how he sees us, we're learning more about him. We're getting closer to his heart and knowing him better, and allowing him to know us better. And so we're going to wrap up with that today. We're going to talk about purpose. When we talked about worth and we talked about identity, we found with both of those that if we find it in ourself and how hard we work, then we're missing the mark, that it's meant to be found in God and who he is. And when we see it that way, 
then we become something different. We become something whole, full, and beautiful, created wonderfully in the image of God. So I'm not a, we're going to talk about purpose today. I'm not a fan of spoilers. In fact, people know not to spoil things for me even when they should. Kevin and I went to see Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I'm a big, 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 big Marvel fan. You, some call me a Marvel nerd, especially the closest people to me. And afterward, we did not like it. It was the first one I did not like. And afterwards, Kevin said, why didn't Tyler warn us? He knows not to spoil. He knows. Even when he should, he knows not to. But I'm going to spoil, I'm going to give you a little spoiler today. We're going to talk about purpose, and I believe we're going to find, and as we talk about purpose, I'm going to invite you to do like we've done before and consider how God sees our purpose, and is this, does it align with how we see our purpose? And I'm going to give you a little spoiler it's going to line up pretty closely with identity and worth. It's going to look a lot like those two. We're going to start in Genesis 1:27. We've been camping there a little bit. And it says this. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so we remember from the very beginning that we are made in the image of God. We are made his children. I joked early on that my kids reflect me in their looks and their personality, for better or for worse. One in one area more than the other, and I won't say who's who and, and which one I prefer. <coughs> but really, so Kevin and I have been married for 15 years, and um, we were about, it was about a year and a half, two years that we were married when we had Haley. And Kevin got started a little bit later than I did, and we were ready to have kids. But we, um, I, I started thinking back on this as I was thinking about being made in the image of God. We think about purpose, and we go, like, why am I here? What is my purpose? Who am I? And I thought the same thing about God, like, why did he create me? What is my purpose? Who am I to him? And I thought, why did Kevin and I have kids? Like, why did we want to have kids? We didn't need them. We didn't need them to somehow fulfill our relationship or make things better. We didn't need them to do chores and thank God because they don't. <laughs> but we wanted them because we wanted to love them. Our love for each other was big enough that we wanted to spread that love. We wanted to have more of that love, and God is the same. God didn't create us because he needs us. The purpose of creating us wasn't because he needed me to have a certain number of kids at Diggin. He didn't need me to spend a certain number of years in the school system. He didn't need any of that, but he wanted me to love me. He wants you to love you. Remember last week we talked about that we are, this is all important, it's foundational, I promise it's going to come together. We are wired to mirror. So we talked about the mirror neurons in our brains and how when little, little kids fall down or something happens to them, they'll look at us. Or babies, this is how babies learn, this is how we learn to respond to emotions appropriately. So they'll look at you first to see how you're going to respond and then they'll respond. It's brain science, I didn't make it up. And so we are made to mirror, and we said we looked at David and who he was and his characteristics, and we looked at some prominent women of the Bible, and we said it's not that they checked off boxes and then we could say, oh, see, look, they did all these things. It's that they spent time in the presence of the Father. Because when we spend time with something, we mirror that thing. We're made to, and this doesn't just end when you're kids. I have friends that I spend time with. I spend most of my time here. I spend a ton of my time with my sister, Jessie, and more and more, like six days a week. And more, yesterday was her birthday, you guys. So if you see her, she turned, uh, she's older than me by a significant amount. She turned like 43. She's 36, you guys. She's younger than I am. We spend a ton of time together, and when we do, we mirror each other a lot. Like our older siblings are like, you guys are so much alike anymore. Same with other people I spend time with. I have a friend that sometimes I talk to that can be pretty negative. And the more time I spend with her, the more I get 
sort of sucked into that complaining, right? Like th- this is sort of how we do, and we're made to do that. And so we said when we looked at David and these prominent women, we saw things like bravery and boldness, and we saw zeal for the Lord, and we saw like blowing off social expectations and all of those things. We saw the Prius man, and we saw the truck man in David. We saw all of that, but we said that those characteristics were results of spending time with the Father because we're made to mirror. And so God himself creates those characteristics. I had a great conversation with Rex on the way out. He said, I have a spiritual question for you. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, well, there's the Prius man, and there's the, like, Blodgett truck man, but I drive, like, a 19-something-something little pickup truck, so where do you think I'm at? I said, wherever God has you to be, Rex. These characteristics that we see in people, so they, we mirror the Father and we exhibit these characteristics of who he is. But this is what I saw, this is what I got from the Father this week. God has all of these characteristics, bravery, boldness, loyalty, love, compassion, zeal, all of it. But none of any of those are who he is. Okay, follow me here. They're characteristics of who he is. See, when we mirror God, we mirror his characteristics, but God is not by itself bravery. God is not by itself loyalty. God is not by itself courage. God is something that results in all of those things, okay? In order to understand who we are made in his image and what our purpose is, we need to understand who God is. So we're going to go to 1 John 4.16. There it is. And it says this. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In fact, earlier in verse 8 it says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love love, bravery, loyalty, all those characteristics of who God is and what we mirror when we're in his image, it's all because of love first. God is love that is willing to correct. God is love that rejoices over you as singing. God is love that creates you intentionally. God is love. He's the embodiment of love. He's pure love. He's powerful love. He is the only true example of love. Now, by the way, love is so much bigger and so much more important than the way we talk about it. It's so important for our kids to understand what love is, that God is love and that this love is that big. Because when our kids think that love is attached to one thing, marital love, or something like that, then when they feel love, they're confused about what that is. Am I, but I love this, so am I supposed to be this? I've talked to young people in school that are like, but I love everybody, so I guess I'm meant to just be with everybody. That's not what love is. See, if we're mirroring God, and we're mirroring what love is, and we're being honest about what love is, that true relationship, that embodiment of what love is, then we're better understanding what those things are, and our kids do too. It's an important distinction that we need to make. I've shared with you guys um, in this series some of the struggles that I've had around worth and identity, but I've not really struggled up until this week. This is, I love how God works because he doesn't waste anything, okay? Not everything is God's will, all right? Not everything is God's will. Things that are not allowed in heaven are not meant to be allowed on earth, right? School shootings are not allowed in heaven. They're not meant to be allowed on earth. It is not God's will, okay? But God doesn't waste anything, and he doesn't waste anything in me when I'm sad, when I'm struggling. This week, for the first time, I struggled with my purpose. I've not really struggled with that. I um, knew I wanted to be a school counselor in middle school, so I went to uh, Philomath Elementary, middle and high, And about, oh, should I say it? Yeah, I'll say it. 23 years ago, I was in middle school. So that's a long time ago. And I had a great school counselor, Jeff Strexness, and I knew then that I wanted to be a school counselor. But then I got older, I grew up, and I wanted to do something easier because school counseling takes about seven years. 
And without fail, when you do a degree, I've found that takes seven years, people say to you, you know, you could have been a doctor, which is not helpful. (laughs) And I would have made more money. So it's not what God called me to do. As an adult, I did, like I knew that God called, was calling me to be a school counselor. It was a really cool moment because I recognized that something that I had wanted to do since I was a kid was actually something God placed on my heart, which is a great feeling. And, and I knew, I mean, just really confident. Kevin and I walked through this, and, and it was so clear in every step of the way God put me with certain people, and he put me in certain places. We moved back to Flomath. I ended up in the Flomath School District, which is where I'd always wanted to be. And I knew, I believed at that time that I would retire from that. I said at first service that I'm a recovering school counselor. I never described it that way before. I told, I, I told people, and I still believe this is true, that school counseling is one of the best jobs in the whole world. And I actually described it like Disneyland for a while. And then I did it for long enough and was like, whew, that's hard. <laughs> totally worth it, but hard. So I did it for about uh, five years. And then, just like I knew God called me into it, I felt him calling me out of it. I was starting to do pastoring here, and I started to get kind of excited about the idea of being a full-time pastor, which the only person in the world that would have ever believed that that would happen was my mother, who told me um, early on that that's what I was going to do, and I told her she was not right, so you were wrong. You were right, Mom. I was wrong. (laughs) This is being recorded, so you'll have that forever. But I was called to leave. I was confident I was called to leave. I knew I was called to leave, and this year has been a great growing year for me. But this week, on Wednesday, I had a lot of painful conversations with the Lord. How many of you know that this has been a really hard year in education, just in general? It's been a hard year, like mass exodus of staff members. But as I was sitting there contemplating with God and praying about this thing, I started to think I had missed it. I mean, I knew, I knew that God called me out. I was confident. But this week I thought, God, are you sure? Because when I was doing that, I knew I was making a difference. I could see it. I could see the programs. I could see the things that we were doing. Isn't that my purpose? Aren't I supposed to be making that difference? Why would you call me out of that? Should I be going back to that? Can't I do, isn't there more I can do? It was a tough, tough day for a lot of people. But God spoke something to me that I've heard, and it's so amazing how he does this. We've heard things, but then he speaks them to us in a way that clicks. This is for you. He said, your purpose is not about what you do. Your purpose is about why you do it. See, your purpose is not about how hard you work. That's the spirit of religion. My purpose is not about where I'm doing the work. My purpose is about the position of my heart. My purpose is about love. See, we're made to mirror God, and God is love. Therefore, our purpose is love. Our purpose is to love. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, do it with love. Love God and love people. Be in relationship with God. Be in relationship with people. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 is the one that I felt God speaking in my heart. The Pharisees here are trying to trip Jesus up. And so they're trying to get him to, one of the things that I always forget when I'm reading the Bible, I'm doing a study in John right now, and one of the, re- the things I always forget is that Jesus was a carpenter. And in this culture, it would not be typical for a carpenter to know all the things Jesus knew and preach them with authority. That would be very unusual. And so they would come and they would try to trip him up because he shouldn't have known these things. They asked him which is the greatest commandment in the law. And remember, Jesus came to fulfill the law. So Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love people. This is our purpose. Our purpose, wherever we are, is to love God, to mirror our Father. That's our identity, children of God. We mirror the Father. We love God. We love people. We're going to look at loving God 
when I first started looking at this, I didn't immediately jump to love as our purpose. I knew love was important, but it wasn't the foundation. It wasn't what I went like, oh, well, we love, and then everything comes from that. I went to what are we called to do? And we're called to praise God. We're called to partner with God in stewarding, in making disciples. We're called to do all those things. We're called to minister to his heart. But those aren't things that we do. Those are results of loving him first. We love God first. We know him. Kevin and I have been married for 15 years, and I can tell you with all certainty that I love him more now than I did 15 years ago, and I know he does the same. This is going to be really awkward if we have a different conversation later. When you talk to people that have been married 50, 60, 30, 40 years, that's what they often tell you. And it's not because Kevin and I don't know each other better today. Like, you would actually think it would go the opposite, right? Like, you know somebody better, and you're like, I'm loving you a little less. You guys have heard me talk about my brain. Listen, in COVID, I got two goats, eight chickens, and a puppy, and we are still paying for that. Kevin knows me better now than he did 15 years ago, and it's only... It's love. It's re- when you get deeper in these relationships, when it's a relationship that reflects the heart of God, you love more. And that's how it goes with God. The more we know him, the more familiar we become with him. This is why Jesus said, I didn't know you. He didn't mean it to condemn, like, I didn't know you. Get out of here. He was saying, I didn't know you. And it's hurt. it hurts his heart. He wants to know us. We're made to mirror our Father, and as we do, we will love him more. We can't help it. You cannot help but love more somebody that loves you that much. I shared Zephaniah 317 earlier. It's not on the screen. I shared it earlier in the series, but it says that the Lord your God is with you. He's a mighty warrior who saves you. He takes delight in you. He calms you with his love. He sings over you with praises like a parent. That's so much love. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, the one-sentence summary of all of it, for God so loved the world. He loved the world, the whole world, all of us, everybody on the world today, all of them, in prison and in the White House, everywhere, that he sent his son to die to bring us back into the fullness of communion with him. And so as we mirror God, that brings us to 1 John 4.19, which says this, we love because he first loved us. We love God because he loved us. We can't help it. The second command is, is to love your neighbor. And that doesn't mean like the person sitting next to you because my guess is you already love that person because you're sitting by them because we have a like a personal space thing in this country. Does anybody else in here, I thought about this first service, does anybody else in here purposefully park so that you have room around your car? Like our car is going to get germs from the other car. We just like have to have all this space, right? Your neighbor isn't just the person sitting next to you. It's not just the person that lives next to you. It's not just the person you spend all your time with. It's very, it was very easy for me yesterday to lavish Jessie with love. I love her. She is my best friend. That was easy. Your neighbor is every person made in the image of God. All mankind. We had a neighbor when we lived in Albany. This is funny because he did actually live next to us, but but he wasn't necessarily somebody we liked, so it still fits. He, he was a nice enough guy, but he was an older gentleman, he was a master gardener, and this neighborhood was really awesome. It was the last rental house we lived in before we moved to Philomath. It was a great neighborhood, and all the people were really kind to each other, but everybody avoided this guy. He wasn't particularly unkind, but he was very, very critical. He had a lot to say about how often we mowed the lawn. He had a lot to say, and by a lot I mean like he talked for a long time. Like, if he was outside, we were like, we can't go yet. We got to wait. I remember instances of that where we're like, wait, he's outside. We got to wait. I'm going to be really honest with you guys. If I pull up to the grocery store and I see people now that I'm like, I don't have time for this, I will also do the same thing. Did you know I'm an introvert? 
my kids are like, we're just going to sit here. And I put your head down. <laughs> but he, uh, he was very critical. He had a lot to say, and his conversations went on for a long time. And Kevin is great at keeping up the yard. It just wasn't to this man's standard. We were in church at the time at the Grove in Albany. And um, I believe Pastor James did a sermon where he talked about that Jesus, he talked about love. And Jesus says in the Bible, like, love your enemies. Like, turn the other cheek. Because he says, anybody can love someone that loves him. Even evil people do that. And I remember going like, okay, it's really easy for me to take treats to all the other neighbors, which I did. But I wouldn't go take treats to him. And not because I was being mean, but because the conversation was going to last forever. So I, I remember feeling like I needed to do something about it, so I made him some jam, and I took it over to him, and it changed everything. Not how long his conversations were, that remained, and not how critical he was, he was critical, but it changed the environment. It changed the conversation. It changed how he related to us and how we related to him. It changed how he related to our kids, who were three and, and an infant. It changed how the neighborhood related to him and to us. See, we're called to love the way God loves. God loves all of his children with a selfless love that sent Jesus to bring us back into perfect communion with him. We're called to love like that. 1 Corinthians 13 talks about love a lot. And it talks about that love is patient and love is kind and love does not boast and love endures all things. But love does that because God is love. God does all those things. God is patient. God is kind. God endures. God forgives. God loves. And when we mirror him, we can't help but do that. See, it's true that we're called to good works. That's true. Ephesians 2.10 says that, that we're called to good works that God created for us beforehand. It is true that we have talents. It is true that he calls us to serve others. It's true that we're called to make disciples. But each of these things are not something God's saying, do this, do this, do this, follow my commands. They're results of the greatest command. Love God, love people. And as you do, you will do these things. We're going to look at John 13, 34 through 35. This is why this is so important. This is why this idea of mirroring and this idea of loving is so important. A new command I give you, Jesus, when he said that, so that was interesting because earlier he shares love God and love your neighbor. And now he's saying a new command. And when I looked this up, what I found is that that phrase more actually reflects pay attention again, listen again. It's not brand new, but you need to listen again. Love one another. Listen to this. As I have loved you, you must love one another. As I have loved you, as Jesus has loved us, we must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. When we love others, people know who we are. When we love others, people see our identity. They see who we are. They see who God is. I was... um, I said before I was having this moment where I was thinking about what our purpose is, but I was thinking about it through the lens of, like, all the commands, the things that we're called to do. We're called to serve. We're called to minister. We're called to make disciples. And I'm going to take you down the rabbit trail of what my brain did because I think it will give you guys a lot of empathy for Kevin. I thought about what is our purpose, what does God call us to do, and I thought about, like, we're called to serve, we're called to good works, we're called to make disciples, and my brain went to the Great Commission. This is actually a pretty straight line. Most of the time it goes all over the place. I thought about the Great Commission, and then I went immediately to the Crusades because that that was that we're going to make disciples. We're going to turn the nations to God. But then I thought, but the first command is to love God, and the second command is to love others, and that was not a reflection of loving others. And God spoke to me this awesome thing as I was cleaning my house, and I texted Jerry immediately, like, oh, my gosh, you got to hear this. It was so cool, and I hope that it blesses your heart. It gets me really excited. See, the spirit of religion, this is why we haven't dropped this concept of the spirit of religion, because the spirit of religion, it twists things. How many of you know the devil twists? 
He twists things. If we think that these commands that Jesus has given us, make disciples, do good works, serve others, is about the works, is about what we can do for God, then we're going to be tricked into thinking that what Jesus is asking us to do is to recruit soldiers for his army. But the war has already been won. We're not called to convince people to fight the war. We're called to love, to do what Jesus did, to, be, to make disciples through the way that Jesus made disciples. And when we do that, what we're actually doing is inviting people to the victory banquet. We're not recruiting soldiers. We're not converting people to create this culture of people that believe a certain way. We're loving people. We're serving people. We're loving God. And through that, we're inviting them to the celebration, to the party that's being thrown because the war is won. The battle is over. When we sang the songs this morning, I was honestly having a, I took a minute to reconcile some things because I've had a hard time this week and I've seen some things that don't look beautiful and I've seen some things that don't feel good. But we sing that God is good and that God is beautiful. And I remembered this, that Jesus said, in this world you have, will have troubles, but take heart for I have overcome the world. The war is won. It changes the way that we think about our purpose. It changes the way that we think about serving others. If we think about it from a position of loving others and inviting them to be a part of this incredible celebration, this incredible family, this incredible space that we exist in, it changes how we approach it. It doesn't feel like work that we have to do anymore. We throw off the spirit of religion and we recognize that this is joy. I have absolutely been guilty, and I'm sure I'm the only one, of saying, I love God just like people are a little harder for me. I'm not like purposefully making eye contact with anybody, but I definitely am. It is impossible to separate the two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to read it again, and I want you guys to notice something that I had never noticed before, that I noticed that I had to, like, wrestle with and then text Jerry about and be like, hey, help me out here. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Notice this. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Not that the second is under it. Not that they come in order Not that, like, do this one after you've done that one because, you know, it's not as preferable. It's like it. It's comparable to it. It's level with it. Love your neighbor like like yourself. Here's the deal. For some of us, more than we love ourselves, frankly. We are also God's children. So we're called to love ourselves this way. We express love for God. When we love God, we praise, we worship, we minister, we serve others, we do these things. We express love for God by expressing love for his children. As intimately created siblings of God with worth and identity. This is where I had to text Jerry because I was seeing this stuff and I was being revealed this thing that... I was going like, is this theologically sound? Because this sounds almost egotistical, and it was this. As the body of Christ, made in the image of God, each one of us sons and daughters of God. Jesus, son of God. Jesus that says, what you do to the least of these, you do to me. We are called to treat everyone with the dignity, love, and respect that we would treat Jesus with. I texted Jerry because I said, I think this is what this is saying. But isn't that a little egotistical? Isn't that saying that we should, like, worship people? And he said, no, it's sound. Because if we are the body of Christ, then treating us as anything less than that is treating Christ as anything less than that. We love others as an expression of love to our Father. Love and tolerance are different tolerating others is not the same as loving others. This is where I was like, ooh, and I had to really dig into myself. We're called to serve others the way we would serve Jesus. 
We're called to talk about others behind their backs the way we would talk about Jesus. I am very guilty of sitting at the preschool with Jesse and being like, oh, my gosh, this is so hard. Why hasn't this mom come yet? Whatever, whatever it is, right, whatever the topic is. We're called to talk about people the way we would talk about Jesus. We're called to treat people the way we would treat Jesus. We're, how many of you, when you really think about that, like I did, go, oh, I don't do that? I don't. But this is what Jesus says about it, in case we're still not sure. In Matthew 25, Jesus is giving more parables. And he talks about the sheep and the goats, and he talks about the end of time and man, the Son of Man coming in his glory and sitting on his throne and separating the people, the sheep and the goats, out. And he says this. I've highlighted verse 40, but it starts earlier on. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat, I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. He goes on and says the opposite to the other group, the group that did, thought they were doing all the right things. They were like going to church and they were doing all the things, but they weren't loving people. Therefore, they weren't loving God and knowing him. They're inseparable. I read it this way, and it was so powerful. It was an article I was reading, and I had to write it down and share it because it was so powerful. There is nothing in the Bible, nothing, that would suggest that it is possible to separate love for God from love for people. To do one, you must do the other. We love and worship an invisible God. It is true that we can see God in his creation and we can see God in all kinds of things, but we, very few people have ever seen God, right? And he has forbidden us to make an image of him. How many of you know that's because we would start worshiping that image? We've seen that over and over and over. But he has put his image into all mankind. To serve God and to love God. God, we serve people, and we love people also. You cannot do one without the other. Our purpose is not about what we do. It's about who we do it for. It's about how we do it. You can be a bank teller or that really super nice guy at Safeway that, like, my kids love, Brian. You guys know Brian? That guy makes my day every day. Talk about serving out of love. You can be the head of OSU. You can be a policy changer. You can, like, get on these, like, these things happen, and you're like, I'm making change. But without love, God's not in it. God is love. And God will not waste anything, and he will use it all. But when you partner with God, you're doing it out of love. 1 Corinthians 13, 2, we're going we're gonna to start to wrap up with this. Because the beavers have another game today, but it's not till 7. But it'll probably go till 2, 3 in the morning, given how it's been going. I need to get a nap in. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains... But do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Our purpose is this. Our purpose is to love. We want to fix the problems of the world we love. We want to make change we love. 
Love is the only force. Jesus, this is how Jesus conducted himself. Remember I said that Jesus made disciples, but he didn't do it by going around, and he didn't do it by convincing people. He didn't post on Facebook, you guys. Can you imagine a world where Jesus was making change without arguing his case on Facebook? How does that even happen? Spoiler alert, Facebook doesn't make change. Love makes change. Love is the only thing that makes change, and here's why. Because God is love. God is the only changing force in the world. Love is the only changing force in the world. We want to see things end. We want to see things begin. We do it through love. Without it, nothing is possible that is possible. Our purpose is to love, to love God, to love others radically, fully. When Jesus says, love them the way I loved you, he died for us. He, first, he washed our feet. Then he healed people of leprosy. If you have, you should definitely read the Gospels because there are things that blow my mind all the time. The fact that he touched a leper is wild. He literally cast himself out of the temple by doing that. He loved first, and then he said, this is why I did that for you. This is why I healed you, because I love you, and here's the saving grace of God. He didn't say, go to the temple first and come back, and then I'll show you I love you. And we're made in that image. We're meant to mirror God. We love the first. We did not deserve it when he came and died for us. So that person that doesn't deserve that $10 because you don't know how they're going to use it, Jesus gives it first and then says, I hope you see the saving grace of this. We, um, one time we're in Albany, I was with my kids, and they were littler then. But I'll never forget, there was a man outside. We had... We were in the process of selling a house, and we were living in a rental, so we kind of had an empty house. And there was a man outside without a place to live, and my son just, like, looked at me and was like, Mom, we have an empty house. Why don't you give him the house? Like, what's the problem? When did we stop thinking that way? Did we? Do we see our purpose the way God sees our purpose? Not because we deserve it, but because he first loved us. As all mankind created with worth and intentional as his children, we love him, we serve him by loving him and loving people. We bring heaven to earth by loving. We make disciples by loving. We're inviting people to this celebration banquet, you guys. That's what we're doing. It changes everything. My prayer for us as we move out of this series and we get prepared, our God prepares our hearts for what Jerry is bringing to us with fire. He texted me. Um, maybe I said this, but he texted me. And he said, tell the people I'm coming back on fire. And he put a little fire emoji next to it. So you know he's serious. As we move out of this one and into the next one, my prayer is that this work doesn't stop here. That God continues to speak to our hearts that we continue to seek our identity in him first. That through that, we recognize what our purpose is because our identity is a child of God made in the image of God to love. That's our purpose. That's our identity. And that our worth comes from that. And when we do that, we throw off the chains of the spirit of religion. And let me tell you what, the enemy does not like to hear that. If we throw off those chains and we live more fully in what God is calling us to do, the world is going to change. It cannot help it. Because God is transformative. He's the answer. I'm going to pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your written holy word. God, I pray that you would just be with us as we leave this place to God today, Lord. Would you um, continue to speak to our hearts and minds? Would you continue to do this great work, God, that you have? Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit, God. Thank you that you made us because you wanted to and that there is nothing we can do to make it about us. 
but that you have given us the most beautiful commission, which is to invite everybody to be a part of this great team, to invite everybody to come to the celebration. The victory is won. The battle belongs to the Lord. We don't need to fight. We just need to celebrate. We just need to praise. We just need to come into your presence to love you and to love each other. We thank you for the great ways that you do things, God. They're so much bigger than what we could fathom. I pray safety and traveling for your pastors Jerry and Kim as they come home. I pray that everybody hearing this message would be blessed. And I just thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.